Hello listeners, Kathy Lawless, Life Story Curator. I'm all about capturing and curating career and life stories as a meaningful way to celebrate a milestone moment like a big old birthday, anniversary, retirement, or graduation. And I'm at my best when curating photo books that move your memories from the basement or your phone or your computer to the coffee table, giving you and your family and friends access to these treasured memories for years to come. I also love curating and capturing life and career stories through this podcast series, How Did I Get Here? It's a series of interviews designed for people just starting out in their careers, people in transition or possibly feeling stuck, and giving them access to the stories of people who have been there, done that, so that they might be inspired with some new ideas or maybe just comforted knowing they are not alone, that everybody starts somewhere and everybody goes through times of transition and times when they feel stuck. Very excited today to be interviewing Shelly Johnson. Welcome, Shelly. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. And Shelly is an executive career coach and fractional talent officer. So I'm very excited. That last part of your title is uh, new, I think new and different. So I can't wait for you to explain that to our listeners. So yeah, no so problem. We're going to pause for a moment to hear from a very happy life story curator client. My name is Eleanor Allen, and I recently finished a project with Kathy about my mother's life story. And the reason I wanted to do her life story was that she's first 91 years old. And second, we've been talking about it for years as a family. I have four brothers and many nieces and nephews, and we had never gotten around to making the book. Then one day I was out with another friend who is a mutual friend of, um, of mine and Kathy's, and she showed me the book that Kathy had made about her parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And I thought right then and there, this is the answer. I gotta hire Kathy to get this life story finally done for my mother. So I did. And working with Kathy is just a joy and a pleasure. So first, how do you organize somebody's 90 plus years into a story that's succinct, but also very interesting? And Kathy helped guide myself and my niece and one of my brothers, I have four brothers, one of them worked on this project with us intensely into the, the uh, storyboarding process and then working into, okay, these are the chapters of her life we're gonna work on, which we went by decade. And then for each decade of her life, what do we need? We need this many pictures and this many um, vignettes. And then Kathy also brought in this great idea to put in QR codes of recordings. I hadn't even thought of that, but we did several of those. Some are my mother's um, audio recordings. We captured some of those audio files. Some are video recordings of her telling stories of her life that we have in the book, but of course, much more detail when we have the recording. And some QR codes are also documents. So we put a link to my father's autobiography that he had written for us before he passed as well. And my grandfather's autobiography that my father had done uh, interviewing my grandfather. So very special and those come to life as well in the book. So I encourage you, if you have any inclination of documenting someone's life story in your life, definitely go for it. It's worth the work and the, the product, in this case, my mother's story is absolutely wonderful and she was over the moon with joy. So don't wait, do it. Document the life of your loved ones or whatever special occasion there is and work with Kathy and you will have a wonderful experience. I would like to start with the icebreaker. So tell us what part of the country or world you were born and raised in, and also a little bit about your family dynamic in terms of number of siblings and birth order, and how you think both those things shaped you, you know, the, ge the ge geographic location, but also mm -hmm. then the birth order. So I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am the youngest. I have a half sister and my father was 14 years older than my mom. And my parents got divorced when I was 13. Um, growing up in Arizona really influenced my focus to be a Spanish speaker. So I've lived all over the world. I, have a, I am bilingual. I have a degree in Spanish. And so geographically, I got to enjoy 
the Hispanic culture and really being close to Mexico and my being the youngest, I think my sister had the opportunity to learn from my parents' mistakes. So I had less mistakes from my parents. Um, <laughs> being the youngest, also maybe I was a little more spoiled. Um, but I had really great parents and I don't know. I think we could probably go into a complete assessment and delve into youngest versus middle versus oldest. And so I hope that gives your listeners something to think about. Yeah, I love that. You know, the the youngest usually has that benefit of, um, I've never heard it described that way before, though, about I didn't have to go, you know, suffer through my parents' mistakes. It's usually, yeah, they were more lenient. I had more freedom, right? They, uh, yeah. they learned what battles to fight or not fight. So <laughs> exactly. Well, I've never teed up that way or spoke about it that way. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just something I thought about when you asked me the question. Yeah, interesting. So what kind of activities? It's interesting, too, that you would bring, uh, you, you were exposed to, you know, the Spanish and all of that. So a whole different culture and a different language, which then opened a lot of doors for you, which is really cool. Yeah, it's it's actually really cool. So what kind of uh, activities did you partake in as a youngster? Sports, music, theater? So I played the piano from a young age. I took eight years of piano lessons. And then in middle school, I was like Lisa Simpson. I played the baritone saxophone and the clarinet. Um, so I've always been really musical. And I also was a swimmer and um, started skiing when I was 10. So enjoy and hiking. Um, that's what I was involved with. Yeah. What made you switch instruments? I play the piano and I don't know that I would switch to a, any kind of a, a wind instrument, you know, because it's, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I guess you can carry it. I don't know. It like somewhere. I think in fifth grade, I got to choose an instrument and I was already on the piano and I'm like, what's that black thing that I have to blow into? So I chose the clarinet. And then in eighth grade, I actually seventh grade, I started playing alto sax. And then in eighth grade, I played the baritone sax in the jazz band. Ah, okay. Well, and I would guess too, that probably after eight years of piano, you're ready for something maybe a little bit different, you know, yeah. and not yeah. keep going on the same thing. Yeah, very exactly. Cool. So yeah. um, I didn't really keep up on anything, but I can tell you, I can still sit down on the piano and read the music and play um you know the entertainer seems to be the most popular coming out of the late 70s early 80s and um chopsticks is still in my repertoire as well oh, the the favorite chopsticks yeah cool. <laughs> awesome well yeah it's a, much easier to sit down and play the piano like at someone's house or at a at a facility that has a piano very few people have a saxophone sitting out that they would say hey just sit exactly down and <laughs> exactly and uh why don't you play a few tunes for us so Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, uh, introvert, extrovert, or ambivert? Oh, I am, I used to be an extreme extrovert, but now I'm, I'm probably more toward the center, but I'm still definitely an extrovert. I'm the extrovert. Okay, well, what, what changed for you? Was it, was it COVID and the pandemic? No, I think, um, I think what changed is that, that extreme extroversion really would sometimes put off introverts. And so I had to learn to kind of come to the middle. And then I think I also calmed down when I, you know, began to mature professionally and learn how to switch styles with others. And the older I get, the more internal I go. Um, but I'm still naturally and organically an extrovert an extrovert i love that you know and i do think that's the beauty of a lot of those uh personality tests is it's the at first it's the self-awareness it's interesting but then it's also how do we interact with each other and what you know what's going to be more effective for me right and that's where we start learning oh i got to dial myself down exactly. or maybe i got to dial myself up because i've been too I'm not uh, using my voice. I'm not contributing. They, you know, mm -hmm. people don't know how, uh, where I sit, what my opinion is, things of that nature. So, okay, very interesting. All right, on the fun meter scale of one to five, one being a couch potato and five being life of the party, uh, where do you put yourself? I would put myself at a four because that extrovert comes out. 
I love dancing and movement. In fact, I became a Zumba instructor three years ago, just before the pandemic. And um, we kept the Zumba classes going throughout um, the pandemic and COVID online. So you did Zumba via Zoom? <laughs> I did Zumba via Zoom. So that's really Zumba, right? <laughs> it is. <laughs> they could have really marketed that very well. They really right? could have. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I love, branding I love Latin part. music, just like I like classical music. And I love Mexican music and Spanish music. And just like I like country music. So I really... Um, because I do, I read a lot and I listen to a lot of music. I can usually talk to anything about anyone at any time. Um, so yeah, I would, I would give myself a four on that fun phenometer or fun the phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we're going to miss it. Move now to the risk monitor. Uh, so on the risk scale, same scale, one to five, one being low risk taker, five being high risk taker. Where, where do you put yourself? I would put myself at a four, actually, um, with the fun meter and the risk meter. I've lived all over the world. I've gone to Japan by myself, went out of college. I started my own business. Um, and we'll probably get into that. But I believe that if you are stagnant in your learning and you're not willing to risk and go and ask something that other people wouldn't or... Um, do things that challenge yourself that you cease to learn you cease to live um this year i actually went to spain and portugal and i led a retreat to walk el camino de santiago and even though i have two kids 15 and 11 i'm like they need to see a, their mom going and being spontaneous and doing adventurously spiritual things so that was probably a longer answer than what you thought, but I would definitely say a solid four. Well, uh, first off, I always reserve the right to overrule my interviewees on their ratings because I'm going to give you a seven. <laughs> I don't think that's a four. I think that's a seven. Um, but anyway, that's, that's just my opinion. Uh, and you. I love your comment, though. So that everybody explains this, and I love how they explain it differently, that how you wanted your kids to see you, right? So they see you taking risks then, you know, that's going to encourage them to take risks maybe. And maybe it doesn't feel like such a risk because, well, if mom can do it, if I can see it, I can be it, right? Um, that's always been a fascinating Absolutely. Thing. I don't want them to have fear of the unknown or, you know, fear meaning future events appearing real. Like take a chance, ask a question, um, push the envelope, do something different that others might not and see where you get you know, no is a complete sentence, but you can absolutely use your voice to ask it in a different way. So I, I definitely do guide my children in that way. I like that guide. <laughs> all righty. Well, I love these questions about who you are as a person and how you grew up and all that, because it really gives us insight as you start to share your story, how you got started, you know, what times when you were stuck times when you feel challenged. So, so let's start getting into your story. So first I like to start with where you are today. So if you would tell us about what it's like to be an executive career coach and a fractional talent officer, and then we'll get into how did I get here? Awesome. So as an executive career coach, I help leaders across the world who have felt completely betrayed or burnt out, overwhelmed, stressed to calm those negative thoughts down and to have stronger mental fitness, not just for their career or profession, but for their life. And I'm also an expert at networking and understanding different types of businesses, whether they be startup, middle market. I've worked for Fortune 50 companies. So my business acumen is very strong and in different verticals, industries, and functions. So it's with that solid foundation that I'm able to meet people from a heart-centered, soul-inspired perspective. And, you know, those words might sound a little bit woo-woo to your listeners, but I like that they do because people don't just live in their heads. They live in their whole body. And I'm all, more of a holistic career strategist 
that really helps her clients stress less, earn more money, and also have more recognition and success, either by accelerating their advancement or by leaning into what their next chapter is going to be. So that's the executive career coaching side. A fractional talent officer is, I was really fortunate in my career to lead talent acquisition for Comcast and Lockheed Martin and Quest Diagnostics. And so that gives me credibility. And as a fractional talent officer, I now go into companies with like 100 employees or more, and I set up their recruitment strategies, their sourcing, how they're going to be more diverse, how they're going to interview without unconscious bias, programs that will help with and align with their value proposition from a community branding perspective to an employment branding perspective and as an employer of choice. And so, so many small to medium-sized businesses can't afford a full-time recruiter or a full-time talent leader. And so what I do is I have clients where I am working eight hours a week for one client and, or I actually do executive retained search as well. Um, I've found HR directors and CFOs and directors of engineering, et cetera. So by doing both, I bring this unique blend and synergy between completely understanding what the business needs are, knowing how to find, source, employ, and retain them, and then coach their leaders if they are having blind spots or are not as productive or motivated or are feeling stuck. So it's kind of like that nice dance between understanding the business side and then the human side of leadership. Yeah. Well, and you get to stay so relevant because not only are you coaching leaders, but you're also a leader leading within a business. So you've got to stay up on all of the latest practices and regulations. Yes, I do. <laughs> So it's, yeah. So it's not like you just said you're doing one part or the other and uh, with a lot of expertise brought in. So, wow. Very exciting. Well, uh, Shelly, let's talk now a little bit about how did, how did you get here? You know, when you were junior high, high school, what were you thinking you wanted to be for a career where it was HR and coaching in, in the realm at the time? Oh my God, not at all. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to be a broad, broadcast journalist. I wanted to be on TV telling people stories. And I went to college with that as my first major. And I had the, I'm not good enough syndrome. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm too fat. They don't like me because I'm this. And I even applied for, like I, I had this interview for the university television. And my best friend got it and I was so jealous. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. So I then I switched into speech communication with a focus in business. And um, I went to school in Spain, my junior year of college. And that's why I was, when I was like, you know what? I'm actually pretty good at this language. I'm going to stay in school another year. And I'm in a dual major in speech communication slash organizational development and Spanish. Um from there, I went to Japan and I taught English and Spanish for two and a half years uh, because I'm, I love being able to learn about other cultures and other, you know, the way people live and eat different foods, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and then I went to grad school and that's where I really had to get serious about what is it that I want to do in my life? So I have a master's degree in international management and I got an internship with Merck Pharmaceuticals in Mexico City. And I partnered with the HR VP, but specifically in organizational development. Um, and I loved it. And then when I graduated, I actually um, got part of the HR leadership development program with Eli Lilly here in the U.S., Wow. Wow. A lot of fortune 500 names there listed. I know all these names, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, I was really blessed. Yeah. Well, I just love how you, it, like you just seem to follow your interests, you know, and you got 
uh, you know, you didn't yeah. get the job you wanted at the university, but then you're like, well, let me look over here. So it do doesn't sound like that devastated you. It just kind of redirected you or it did devastate you. And then you just got over it finally. <laughs> no, I don't pitch a tent very long in what's not working. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, I'm very curious and I explore different things. So all I did was really kind of switch within the same you know, the same department and it turned out really well. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, being able to go study abroad and then take what you've learned there and then to go to another country altogether and one with a language you don't even know. So back to that risk level of a seven, maybe we were more of a nine. Um, <laughs> and now but you're teaching two languages you do know, but to one that you don't know. So, you know, that's got to be an interesting, um, you know, an interesting challenge in itself. So Anyway, well, very cool. So you then, so what really kind of turned you on to organizational development then? What, I mean, was there, it sounds like maybe one class piqued your interest. And then once mm -hmm. you started looking in the industry and, and meeting with leaders, and then you could really see how it played out. And, you know, so interesting that you mentioned that it was the first time that my university offered organizational design and development as a class. And I took it. And then that summer through my professor, I got in with um, a department of transportation and I taught Spanish and diversity and inclusion in the late nineties. So, okay. That was, you know, pretty, so I, I got an internship, time, shouldn't have been, but <laughs> I, I got an internship with it and um, it really, really interested in me very much. Yeah. So now you're doing the work that you're going to school for and it's breaking, um, you know, it's, uh, what I want to say it's on the what's the word I'm looking for there it's on the edge breakthrough at the time and yeah very exciting so tell us more about how you um you know then where you, you came back to the U.S. then you said with Eli Lilly what what was that transition like then so all of this seems feels like success 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 was there any doubt in there or any um challenges along the way or was it pretty much just hey I'm working hard and I and it's paying off well, I had worked hard and it was paying off. Um, but in the midst of all of this, my father was very ill or sick for 10 years. And so I had the opportunity to go anywhere in the country or in Latin America, but I stayed in Arizona and I, when Eli Lilly owned PCS health systems and I was in a rotation in human resources and I did really well in talent. I did really well in as an HR generalist, but I bombed it and did not succeed in compensation. And that was my first time really as like, you know, mid twenties, not successful. And again, so I had to learn a lot about professional maturity, um, understanding where, how to pivot again. And Lily actually got bought by um, Rite Aid, who had the worst stock performance of that year. And so I did not take a job with Rite Aid. So I went to work. Gosh, you're really pushing me back far <laughs> to think about where I was. Um, you know, I, I worked at companies like Poor Brothers Potato Chips that owns Boulder Potato Chips. I was a director of HR at 29. And a lot of responsibility because of that risk taking and a lot of failure. I don't know. I don't know because I didn't have the experience at that corporate level. I would do things that weren't as professionally mature as someone who was 39 versus 29. Mm. And I learned so much through that. Oh, I definitely got fired from jobs. Um, but again, I don't, I don't pitch a tent in that valley of despair, I, what did I learn? How do I move forward? Part of it is just grit. Part of it's resiliency in those situations. And also I had a good therapist that helped me through some of the <laughs> mental health types of things. Um, but I networked a lot. I got good jobs and, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career. Um, 
And that kind of brings us to, I moved to Denver. Um, I was transitioned with Lockheed Martin. I was a senior manager of talent acquisition and workforce planning and all these, I had like 23 people under me. And it was really a big job, too big for me. Um, and I was successful with the things I was great at, but I wasn't successful in other areas. Like 22 people is too many people. Um, I had a lot of fresh out of college where the communication was different. And I thought I was advocating for them, but they didn't define it in that way. And so I learned, I learned a lot, but I also lost part of myself. Well, yeah, you, you said that the job was too big for you with 22 people reporting to you. I'm thinking that's too big a job for anybody. But I will say, I think when you're younger in your career, you don't even know that you should be saying this job is not sized properly. You know what I mean? You don't have the wherewithal to try to figure out how, right. to, how to say this needs more. Um, I need more levels here. You can't have that many direct reports. How do we restructure this, et cetera? So, yeah, that's a, a that is, I think, a maturity thing to stand up and say, this isn't working and it's not me and it's not my fault. It's the way it's structured, you know, and it's outside. Well, it's also not just a maturity thing. It's a courage. Yeah. Yep. It's a piece of courage that a lot of people, those introverts or especially women or BIPOC might not feel comfortable to say because of fear, fear of being incompetent, fear of loss of job, fear of loss of stability, just overall fear. Um, with that. Yeah. And it, yeah, that whole, I, I, well, they hired me into this and that person that was here before was doing it. So yeah, I can see how you get trapped in, into that piece of it. So, so how do you think you, you got your courage? I mean, you talk about that you're a risk taker. Um, I mean, what, were your parents pretty courageous and fearless? I mean, did you have those role models or do you just think, uh, I mean, I interviewed one gal and she's like, I don't know. I think I was just born with an extra dose of courage. And I'm like, well, or confidence. She said confidence. And I was like, wow, that's, that's good to know. Where, where do you get that? Is there a store? <laughs> Is, Is there, there a, a store or a confidence pill that we can yeah. take? Yeah. Um, both of my parents were entrepreneurs. They both showed bravery in a lot of different ways, which I think was emulated or role modeled to me. Um, I do think I was born with some of it. They, you know, purely out of survival when my parents got divorced and I was really kind of on my own in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also part of it is faith in having the alignment of what you believe that the universe will give to you and conspire for you to have. Um, I will say without, and I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about faith from uh, knowing that there's something greater that that you can lean on if that's how you believe. Yeah, yeah. So that's that that's kind of what kept you grounded, and you had a, maybe an inner knowing that you were on the right track, or that you could mm -hmm. bounce back, or that you could do certain things maybe if you hadn't done them before, huh? Part of it's an inner knowing. Part of it's a like internal fortitude of, I can bounce that, I'm going to be okay. Um, you know, honestly, some of it's probably white privilege, um, which we can, I'm very into DEI, our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, I got lucky to go to college. I'm a first generation college student. Um, I think it's really knowing and having that intestinal fortitude that you can make it through anything and have the resiliency to get through adversity, which takes us to a whole deeper level. Ah, yeah, because you have to experience adversity to know you can get through it, right? You do. Yeah, yeah. So tell us then, so you moved to Colorado, you're now in big jobs, one you felt was too big. How did you kind of move on from there then? And then is, is, is there more there, more pieces in there before you just decide to start your own business or? You know, I left Lockheed Martin and I got picked up by Comcast for technology product and experience as their director. And it was a very quick move. I probably should have done some, found my own coach 
And honestly, I was with Comcast for a year and I felt so numb, so stuck. I had gotten to this level uh, at a director of a Fortune 50 company. And then I was like, I feel completely like my soul has been sucked out of my body. My shell of who I am is showing up. But now what? It's almost like you're present, but you're not. It's mm -hmm. like you. And so I happily accepted a severance package, which they were very generous with. And I was like, I'm going to start my own business. I'm the breadwinner. I have two kids. My husband's been a stay at home dad. We've gone, come through a lot of life. And I, I literally was like, I can't do corporate anymore. And so I started reaching out and I'm like, Hey, I'm doing resumes. And I had some people put me on retainer as an executive coach. And I went out and hustled and got to know a lot more people. I networked. I started um, with positive intelligence, which I'm now in certified in. And I just kept getting referrals or I would go out on LinkedIn and get, you know, um, I would find clients and my first year I made probably what I made when I was 27. And I'm like, I'm going to keep at this. My second year, I doubled that. This is my third year and I've had a 74% increase in revenue. Um, and I'm now multiple six figures more than I was making in corporate. Yeah. And I'm I guessing that that'll I'll continue. Yeah. Kathy, <laughs> I hope. Right. I mean, being an entrepreneur is not for the faint of heart. No, no, it's not. So first off, I just want to say congratulations. Those are some great accomplishments. And especially in these times when things are outside of the norm, but the, with a new norm, maybe. But um, that's awesome because, you know, you, you know, a lot of times a company, the severance package is such an opportunity to restart. Right. And reset. For sure. And, because you're receiving that payment and then you can start into what you really need to do. And sometimes you need that little push off the cliff to, uh, you know, to take that risk. So um, I'm guessing too, in your entrepreneurial space, you're not working the kind of hours that you were working maybe in corporate. And it must be more fulfilling, obviously, than because you said, you know, that the corporate was kind of, you know, sucking your soul away. <laughs> so as an entrepreneur, you have more time to do anything. You have freedom, but how you structure that time, how you market yourself, what you focus on, how you brand yourself. It's kind of literally like you are a jack of all trades and you can't be everything to everyone all the time. You really do have to niche down. And I've been terrible at that, Kathy, like <laughs> terrible. Um, because you just, when you first starting, you're just like saying yes to everything. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until literally about six months ago that I said, no, that doesn't feel right for me. And I've redirected. Um, if that answers your question. I feel yeah. like well, and and answer. as you said before, no is a complete sentence. We were just talking about this last night. I was with some other women uh, leaders, the, the part of this group I'm in, the wise women. And um one of the things we were talking about was this, you know, how the pandemic has helped us all step back and enjoy doing nothing more than we doing nothing more than we did when we were before the pandemic. So before the pandemic, we were in all these activities, going to events, doing all this stuff. Now doing nothing and being home is such a reward and such a treasure that we're not doing as much as we were, if that makes any sense. I don't think oh, it I'm makes total sense. Networking and has, I mean, I could literally go to three networking events a week or more. And I'm like, no, I want to be with my family. I want to join the groups that are very aligned values wise, and that I can provide something that, to their community and vice versa. I do think people really have changed and businesses are needing to be much more agile to align with the new employee. Yeah. I think they're looking at employees as, um, uh, as human beings, as a whole human being. When you mentioned that earlier, that struck a chord with me that we recognize we were all human through this whole thing, which meant how do we deal with the human side of things versus just, well, if you want to keep your job, you have to travel, you know, three weeks out of the month 
or yeah, you yeah. have to do all this travel, uh, you know, or you have to work all these hours. And now the thinking is more about how do we keep you whole and that you don't leave? How do we retain you? <laughs> and and how do we keep your mind as sharp as you want it to be? So you're innovative and all that, you know, it just seems like a real shift um, I, I, about I, the human side and bringing the whole human to the picture and not just this part where I just need you for this, you know, eight to five situation. And then you can do whatever you want. But it's like, no, I want the whole person because all of you is going to be better. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And it's a nice shift. Um, some companies that are more paternalistic are not moving as quickly and they're feeling it. Yeah, they're losing talent. They're losing talent. Yeah. Well, so I'm sure we could keep going all afternoon on a variety of philosophical questions and keep going down this path, but we probably do need to start wrapping up. So I have two wrap up questions. And the first is when you look back on your career, Tell us what you think served you best. You know, it can be a characteristic, a strength, a discipline, a habit, but what do you think really has kind of served you best? I think two things, um, having grit and also being resilient because if there's one constant thing in life, it's change. Um, I could come up with a lot of other adjectives, but those two things in being able to assess the situation and be like, what does that feel like? Is that going to be for me or not? And just continue to move forward. That's the grit piece and the resiliency piece. Yeah, I see. I see both. I see both in your story. And like when we were talking about that, that first uh, job at the university that you didn't get, and then all of a sudden, bang, well, I, then I'm studying abroad and I'm doing this and I just shifted. And that's what I'm finding from a lot of the interviews I've done is that seems to be a really good way to get out of being stuck and a good way to transition into something, right? Is just find that next thing, mm -hmm. which is hard to do. Cause I think if you're not comfortable with risk, you overthink it, you, it has to be perfect. I mean, there's all this pressure you put on it where sometimes it doesn't have to be that hard. Just follow your interest and then good things really start to happen. They really do. It's, it's amazing. I completely agree. All right, well, let's move into then the second wrap up question, which is any words of wisdom that impacted you when you were going through a time when you felt stuck or in transition? Eight years ago, I went to Spain for the first time to walk El Camino de Santiago, which is the road of, or the route of St. James. Um, it's on lots of people's bucket list. And I was stuck in a lot of different ways. My marriage was not good. We were separating. I was not happy in my career. Um, my, I had two small kids and, and I was just not in a good place. And there was a message that I heard um, while in Santiago de Compostela that says, no matter where you are in life, there's going to be mountains. And it's really, it's very aligned with the actual route and path. The Pyrenees is where you start in Idun, and then you walk through and you hike through these very treacherous mountains for days. And then you get to this area called La Meseta, which is, you can picture Don Quixote, the trudge on his burrow with like dust flying up. It's very monotonous. It's the same thing. There's no hills. And that's part of the middle of Spain. And that goes on for days. You might not see people. And then you get to the last two weeks of the path or the journey, and it's hilly. And the message there for me is that no matter what life brings, whether there are times that are very treacherous and hard and truly difficult, then there are times in life where there it's just stable and easy and not a lot of dust is flying up. And then you have kind of hilly points that no matter what, that the universe walks with you and supports you the entire way. That has really been the foundation of my heart and my soul which allows me to get over fear faster. Wow, I, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. 
that perspective. And, you know, what, what was occurring for me as you were talking was, you know, sometimes I remember in my life, I thought if I could just get to the top of this hill, whatever the challenge was at the time, then I'll be set, not recognizing there's always going to be another hill, right? Or also not recognizing that sometimes something is going to get easy. I remember there was a time when I things did get easy. And then I felt very um, unsatisfied or nervous. Why is it so yep. easy? I need to make it hard. And so it was really, it's very funny how you, if you're not being present and enjoying where you are and what you're doing, the journey at the time, and all you think about maybe is the destination or about how do I get through this? Um, then you're just never, I don't know, you're just not experiencing life in a way you're wishing your life away, maybe. But anyway, that was very, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. How you said that was very um, relatable and very inspirational. So thank, thank you. Thank you. I hope, I hope your listeners get some inspiration out of it. Um, and you'll notice I'm not talking about any particular religion. I think that the, that's a metaphor for life mm -hmm. is that everyone's mm -hmm. going to have time that are mountainous hilly or just a straight path you have to live within all of those and be present and move forward no matter what yeah yeah that's another big message out of that right you had to move forward through that whole thing you couldn't just stay in any one place um that wasn't the point of it so you know i think you're the fourth person i've interviewed who has done um is it the campo would is that what you would call it Really? The fourth person. Um, yeah. It's called El Camino de Santiago. El Camino. Yes, I'm sorry. So as I, as I think about this, I'm like, oh, do I need to connect these people? Because you all live in Colorado. Well, one one doesn't. Um, she actually lives, I think, in Europe now. She was, I interviewed her during COVID and she was actually in like Mexico on a beach somewhere, but she'd been in Australia and she'd started in England. Sounds and, like my kind of person. And yeah, I mean, she was, and, and, and she was on that journey of what do I want to be? Who do I want to be? And how does that, you know, how does doing the walk really help? Mm -hmm. On that note, so many people that I work with are like, what's my purpose? Who do I want to be? By experiencing life and letting life happen and looking into your interests, and being curious and exploring, that's how you continue to pivot toward who you want to be. It's a daily journey. It's not, I'm going to become this if I read this book. It's a daily practice that you have to focus on. That's what I think um, helps me continue to take risks and be present in my own life and career. Yeah. Wow. An extra nugget on top of all of the other words. <laughs> so, well, Shelly, thank you so much. I'm so glad our paths crossed and I'm excited now that you're part of another community, the Colorado Thought Leaders Forum. So who knows where that might cross our paths again in terms of keeping this um, new relationship going. So thank you for sharing your story today and uh, being so open and vulnerable. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. So on that note, I'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, listeners, if you enjoyed today's interview, please subscribe below so that you'll be alerted when other interviews are published. And if you have any questions for me or for Shelly, you can find this interview on my website, lifestorycurator.com. And I'll also post Shelly's social media and contact information so that if you want to get in touch with her, it's easy to do so. And on that note, I'll say stay safe, stay well, and let's keep sharing those stories. Have a great day.